This is Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast that examines aspects of arts and cultural production. I'm Paula Blair and I'm joined this time by film historian Andrew Scheel, talking about his research on the emergence of the star system in early cinema, centering on French performer Max Linder. Most of this discussion was recorded in early 2018 and there's a little redux at the end explaining updates and changes and why we held it back for so long. Thanks to supporters at patreon.com forward slash avcultures and everyone engaging on social media. There'll be more information on how to support the podcast and get in touch at the end. For now, enjoy the discussion. Dr. Shale. Dr. Blair. Hello. Would you please outline what we've just watched and how it relates to your research? Okay, so we have just watched, I hesitate to call it a documentary, but that's what it's presented as, Mm. called L'Homme au Chapeau de Soie, which means The Man in the Silk Hat, which was a film that Maud Linder made about her father, Max Linder, in 1983, and one that I've only recently got hold of because it was unavailable for a while, there was Mm. versions on YouTube that were quite low resolution and in bits, but finally got hold of it. And this is a documentary made by a daughter about a father who she never knew knew because he died in fact he killed himself when she was six months old as we learned on one of the little extras for this documentary on this particular dvd which is by i believe Edition Montparnasse. We learned that she only found out that her father had been a famous film star when she was 10 years old from a nanny who was Australian and, like many people at the time, remembered mm-hmm. massive film stars of the 1910s and early 20s. I watched it knowing that Maud Linder's awareness of the events of her father's life was a mixture of patchy and actually incorrect because I'd read her book Max Linder et mon père, Max Linder was my father, and based on published documents documents from during Max Linder's life, things like newspaper articles, posters for his films, I was able to tell that she had made some errors in that book, and some of these errors cropped up again in The Man in the Silk Hat that we've just watched. We went into it knowing that this was the case. This is something which, of course, irks me a little bit, but in your case, you're aware that when people tell stories, it's about 25% fiction. Mm -hmm. There's a fictional element to it that just making it Mm -hmm. up is a creative act, even when what you're doing Mm -hmm. is presented ostensibly as documentary. And I suppose the way that this one was done, it wore its, we're making some of this up on its sleeve because in places it would use bits of films from a lot later in Max's career as if they were documentary footage of something that had happened early in his career, in his real life. The opening one's quite revealing, it's Mm -hmm. from a film that he made in about 1914 I think, where he made it back in Bordeaux where he'd grown up and he made it using his own parents and his own sister and it was quite a funny slapstick Mm -hmm. comedy but they used that to illustrate his youth and his teenage Mm. It's quite clear that it's not actually documentary footage, so I think that's the model for what's going on in quite a lot of this. It's, this isn't necessarily accurate documentary, mm. although at certain points it did slap historical documents on the screen. So at one point, for example, the point where she just very abruptly goes, and then he killed himself. Mm. There's lots of newspaper clippings that appear. I learned a few things about his time in America. Interestingly, right at the end, she says, I don't know why he killed himself. He and his wife at the time did it together. I don't know why he killed himself, and I've never tried to find out. Mm. So there's actually an admission at the end of, okay, so I know these facts. I've learned a lot about my father and watched a lot of his films, and I champion his films, but actually there's some things I don't want to know about. So I think what we've watched is one part documentary, one part love poem to silent comedies, and another part playful invented history. It's a story about Maud Linder, really, rather than a story about Max Linder. It's a story about somebody who's found out some things about her own life. All credit to her, when she made this, she made the decision to do several different versions speaking several different languages. Mm-hmm. So she spoke, at least at the time, very good English, and so did the voiceover herself mm-hmm. for the, the English version that we've just seen. The DVD contains a French version and an Italian version as well, so presumably she did the Italian one too. This is somebody who, even from the 60s, became a bit of a minor celebrity in France as somebody who was both Max Linder's daughter and who was championing the preservation and appreciation of his films. I keep calling him Max Linder, but of course, 
course, it's more probably pronounced Max Lander. The reason we watch this is because I'm right at the end now of a huge research process of producing a book on why it is we have film stars at all. And it might sound like an odd question because we have film stars because films have performers in them and some of them are more popular with the public than others and <laughs> some of them have their identities quite prominently used in publicity. But that's not an inevitable aspect of all cultural industries. Some of our cultural industries get on quite well with either anonymity being the norm. My go-to example for this is, you know when you have a lollipop and it's got a joke on the stick? Does the person who writes those jokes ordinarily get their name credited on any packaging? No, of course not. Either there are industries where the norm is anonymity, or there are industries where the norm is something gets credited, but it's not the identity of any of the creative personnel, or even a specific category of creative personnel. And my go-to example for that is Disney films, because Disney films, almost universally, the posters for them, don't advertise the identities of the voice artists. I'm talking mainly about animated films here. They don't advertise the identities of the voice artists who've done these films, even when those voice artists are quite famous, Mm -hmm. because the identities of these people, that's not the model for the identity we ought to be associating with the product, the model that Disney uses at least, is that it's the identity of the company that we ought to be associating with the product, so the one name that persistently appears, and it was of course originally the name of a person, on Disney posters is that of Walt Disney. So it's not inevitable, but it did happen and it happened for very specific reasons at a specific time and in a specific place and what I found after well over a decade of back-breaking shoveling in archives around the world is that the star system first emerged in France and it first emerged with Max Lander and the fact that it emerged in France had quite a direct influence on its emergence in the United States in that it both provided a model for some of the production companies in the US to follow in trying to break the stranglehold that a set of older American film companies at the time had over film production and distribution and it also represented an extra weapon in the arm of Max Landais' employer, Pathé Frère, we of course often call them Pathé, which the American companies had foreknowledge of the arrival of this new way of publicising films by using the identity of the people performing in them. The Americans had foreknowledge that Pathé was about to start using this in the US, so they had a motive to try and match it with their own homegrown equivalents. So there's quite a complicated story to do with the attitude of American production companies to companies from Europe importing films into the US, which is a mixture of actually relying on them to be able to make up for film programmes, but also trying to limit how large a percentage of the film market in the US any non-US production company constituted. And so out of this set of international conflicts came the star system in the US. But the very simple reason why it first emerged in France, and the date was something in the region of the 4th to the 9th of September 1909. The reason why it first emerged in France was very simply that the Pathé Company, they realised that members of the general public were treating Max Lander, they were treating him as a production value, in that they were treating him as an element that had gone into the making of a film that represented one of its virtues. And they were treating him as such even though they didn't know his name. So they were capable of recognising him from film to film, in part because he's got quite distinctive Mm -hmm. features, he's got really big eyes, Mm -hmm. and quite a large forehead. He tends to wear his hair slicked back, so there's very little hair in his his silhouette. It's just a really big forehead, big white eyes, big black moustache, and quite a mischievous grin, Mm -hmm. as you observed. And the fact that he was actually quite a good comedy performer as well. All these things were making it so that audiences were capable of recognising him from film to film, and seemingly actually seeking out films that had him in them, even though his name wasn't being used in publicity. And the reason why Pathé found this out was because for about an eight-month period before September 1909, it's more actually more like nine or ten-month period, Lander stopped working for them. He'd been working for them for a few years at that point, and on quite a casual basis. But he stopped working for them to try and have a real go at making his name on the stage, and he didn't. And so he came back to them and started working for them again, and within the first few weeks of Lander working for them, it became apparent that all audiences were recognising him in spite of the fact that he hadn't been appearing in films for them for something like eight or nine months. Mm. And so the blatant evidence that the Pathé Company obtained at that point was this guy was so recognisable that he was being recognised from films that people had seen a year earlier. Mm -hmm. And so at that point they went, hey, we've been observing the basic principle over the course of the last few years that we've been employing anyone on even a semi-permanent basis, that we don't publicise their names because we run the risk of turning individuals into 
of production values, of investing in publicity about them and thereby turning them into production values, into things that have economic value in excess of the value of their labour. And if we do this, anyone whose name we've built up with the public can, at the next time that their contract expires, and contracts at this point were short term, the next time the contract expires, they can just leave and go somewhere else. And so there was this fear of arming one's competitors, mm-hmm. which meant that there was this general principle of anonymity. What had happened with Pathé is with Max Linder, they'd realised, hey, even though we have this existing policy of anonymity, Max has become production value with audiences anyway. And at that particular point, they just signed Max on for a year. And I think some people at Pathé went, if we build him up as a production value, and if at the end of this year he then leaves, yeah, he'll take that value to somebody else. But during that year, mm-hmm. the exploitation that we can achieve of his identity, if we do publicise his name, may very well far outweigh any losses we might make in the long term on this. So let's just do it. Let's go in with all guns blazing. And so they started a publicity campaign where they produced posters that named him and they produced display cards for cinema foyers or lobby display cards that named him. They issued his name to the trade press. They issued his name to the popular press as well. They went all into erecting a public profile for him so that his name would be known amongst the general public so that they'd be able to associate it with his face and his mannerisms as well. He had quite a distinctive set of comedy mannerisms and so that they could capitalise on what was clearly a talented performer who was going to be with them for nearly a year at that point. Once a company has decided to do that, you then get a situation of other companies in the industry having to go, do we follow suit? Because now Pathé, and Pathé was the senior film company in the entire world at this point. They were outproducing even the most prolific of the American companies. Pathé's competitors had to go, okay, Pathé's decided to do this. Do we maintain our relatively risk-averse principle of anonymity, or do we take the risk that Pathé's just taken and possibly erect our own film styles that are just as profitable for us as Max Linder is? And interestingly, it did take a few years, but almost the entire European film production industry had converted to using at least one named performer per company by the end of 1911. Everyone had begun to do it in Europe and North America by 1913. So it did take some time, but basically between the point when Pathé started this campaign for Max Linder in September 1909, and I think it's April 1913 when the last company finally says, OK, we're going to do this, the European and North American film industries acquire a star system. It's quite a radical thing to do, to go from an industry which doesn't use the name of the people who are the most prominent aspect of the product because they're the people who are visible in every product. I'm not talking here about the names of the producers or the screenwriters. They go from a situation where that's not done to a situation where publicly, not just crediting, but issuing publicity for performers in films is now the industry habit. And given how very specific the circumstances that led to the Max Linder publicity campaign were, that's not something which was inevitable the industry would do at that time. Perhaps it was highly likely that the industry would do it at a certain point. When the industry became stable enough, when there were people regularly performing for films, when camera distances were close enough to make their faces recognisable from one film to another, when contracts were relatively long-term. We have all these precipitating factors, but it wasn't necessarily inevitable that when they all came around, in short order, a star system would emerge. It seemed that a set of unlikely circumstances needed to happen in addition to that to precipitate the first of these campaigns, the one with Max Landau, And so it's conceivable that a tiny adjustment in events, one example could be the guy who Max Landau was understudying for the play that he was at, it was at the Théâtre de Variété in Paris, and the play was called Le Roi, the King. The guy who was understudying in this play in early 1909, his name was Max Dearly. If Max Dearly had actually been less healthy during that time, Max Landau, who was understudying him, would probably have had more opportunities to play the principal role in the play that Dearly played, and therefore may well have made his name as a theatre performer and may well not have ever gone back to Pathé, meaning that Pathé would never have found evidence that he was recognisable with audiences and therefore would never have had the prompt to launch a star system. If that had happened, just a slight improvement in the health of one person, perhaps the star system would have emerged in, say, Denmark in 1911, or the star system would have emerged in the US in 1912. It's not a matter of inevitability. That's the main thing that I've unearthed, is that this may be ennobling the story a little bit, but one of the things that's been stressed in the past few years about the First World War, which we've had all these centenary commemorations of, is that the start of the war was the result of a really, really unlikely set of events. So it wasn't simply that there were these two groups of opposed world powers that were very good at not going to war, and then had their usual armoury of methods for not going to war removed from them 
by the unusual circumstances of the summer of 1914. It wasn't just that. It was things like when Gavrilo Princip killed Franz Ferdinand, he'd actually tried to do it earlier that day by throwing a bomb at his car, and he'd failed, and he was drowning his sorrows in a nearby cafe, having escaped from the scene of the whole thing. And then, completely by surprise, the car carrying Ferdinand and his wife on its way back from the event that Franz Ferdinand had been attending that day, the car carrying them both drove down the street that the cafe that he was sitting in was on. And even that wasn't enough to mean that Princip would kill Franz Ferdinand. What seems to have made it so that he basically had the opportunity handed to him on a plate was that the driver of the car wasn't a very good driver and managed to stall a car immediately outside the cafe. And so all you would need to do to have made it so that the First World War didn't start when it started would be just to go back in time and help somebody with learning to drive. So same thing, just a tiny, tiny little unlikely event that could have been avoided by an accident if the guy who wasn't very good at driving that morning had slipped while walking down the stairs and injured himself. Perhaps another driver would have been found who was a better driver. I wanted to point this out, that something similar is going on with the emergence of the star system. It's not inevitable. It may be likely to happen at some point, but it's not likely to happen at a certain point. In fact, the reason why things happen at certain points are because of coincidences of very unlikely and very small events. So, that's the book in a nutshell. <laughs> Although what I do point out is that I use about half the book to do this. When we get film stars, the first film stars that we get are people who are, at the time, they're consistently playing, or at least have been in the bit of their career leading up to when their star campaign starts. They've been consistently playing series characters. These are characters where it's the same character appearing from film to film, but each film is a discrete narrative, as distinct from serials, where it's a single narrative broken up into several films. And so when Max Lander, when his publicity campaign first started, he had been cobbling together a character that was informally known as Max at the time. This character would bear the name Max in intertitles in some of the films. It didn't bear the name Max in the titles of the films. That started a little later. But he was cobbling that together. And then his counterpart in the US... Florence Lawrence, who was by a very small margin the first US film star, although I have to admit that, like many US film stars, she was actually born in Canada. She had been playing a serious character called Mrs. Jones in the period shortly before her first star publicity campaign started. And so it seems to be the case that not only do lots of very unlikely things have to happen to get a star system, but you also need to have something in place already which is a bit like a star system, but which uses fictional characters rather than real people. Mm -hmm. So we have the recurring appearance of a fictional character from film to film that recognisability of a fictional person perhaps through costume through mannerisms through the type of narratives they get involved in that seems to need to also be in place and so the shift at the time was a shift between one system and serious characters where you ubiquitous in 1909. The industry in both Europe and North America had adopted the practice of making serious character films in late 1908 and early 1909, and so by mid to late 1909 they were all over the place. So it seemed that what needed to happen was a system that was a bit like a star system, but which didn't use real people, but which used fictional people instead. That needed to come in place, and then there was the slightest of shifts into having something similar to it but which used real people it might seem like a huge momentous change and I want to document why it is between 1908 and 1913 the industry did basically reorient itself at least it reorient its marketing practices it may seem like a huge momentous change but looking at it stage by stage it's a set of very minor transitions and that I suppose is the take home message of the entire book significant changes do occur in histories of anything but they amount as a result of at the time what probably look like insignificant transitions which is why no one leaves any record of this period going hey here's a diary entry I just decided to launch the first stardom (laughs) building publicity campaign for someone and what I've noticed in particular is that with the first decision to launch a stardom building publicity campaign in the US the guy who decided to do it who was Carl Lemle because he may have directly copied what Pathé were doing with Max Landia when he launched this campaign for Florence Lawrence he seems to have actually had a motive not to mention that to anyone because if he ever produced an account of it, he wanted to look back and go, hey, look, I invented the star Mm -hmm. system, didn't I? Rather than going, after a trip to Europe in the summer of Mm -hmm. 1909, where I noticed a few things about publicity for stars in France, with about this guy Max, I basically copied the system Mm -hmm. when I got back to the US in about... October, November 1909. So it's been a rampage through a lot of evidence bases where the evidence in some places is missing because this is 
from an event that happened 100 years ago and lots of stuff just doesn't get kept. When stuff does get kept, it gets damaged by floods and so there's attrition on archives and so there's lots of gaps in holdings of newspapers and magazines, say, for example. But there's also partial puzzles here because people kept secrets. They didn't write stuff down. They deliberately misinform. What I've probably had to do is put something like seven or eight partial puzzles one on top of the other. And it's only when you do that that you can see this seems to be the most likely train of events. And I must admit, the whole thing is a story of not this definitely happened, but this is the most likely set Mm -hmm. of events given what we can show to be true. I'm very big on what we can show to be true as well because, let's say, this trip that Carl Lemley made from the US to Europe in the summer of 1909 and the trip that he made when he returned in November 1909, I think it was actually late October 1909, this trip, it's mentioned in trade papers, but actually I thought that's not good enough. I went and I found the passenger manifest for the ship that he sailed on returning from Southampton. I think to New York it wasn't particularly difficult to find because the Ellis Island project have digitised these mm-hmm. passenger manifests for well over a century and so I can show the exact date on which he arrived back in the US although of course I've forgotten what the exact date is mm-hmm. it's written down somewhere you'll have to buy the book it will be published all being well either inside of this year or early next year we know what academic publishers can be like Mm, glacial (laughs) also we've both worked with academic publishers who've surprised us with their speed but nonetheless it's going to have something like 90 images in it Mm -hmm. because book about early cinema books about early cinema which don't have any images in we must (laughs) I think actually well that's a bit harsh we must not suspect them we must suppose the publishers went no no you can't have images is in your book that would be silly or they're horrendously expensive yeah and that's what some publishers do is they go oh you want to do you want to write this book about art history or any sort of visual culture mm-hmm. history right okay so yeah well, i'd love to put some images in your book so we'll give you three for free if you want to have more than three you have to pay us a hundred pounds per image mm-hmm. and blah blah blah, blah. and even and more so, if you want it in yeah. color yeah and so the, the you know net result people write these books about visual culture which have no images either no or next no images mm-hmm. in them i have had to pay the publisher a bit of money to put these images in but I think it's going to make the difference because these images they're not just hey here's a drawing of Max Linder from a poster these images are this poster exists it's in this archive it advertises this film which came out on this date as I can show from this trade paper Mm -hmm. and as you can see from the poster it mentions Max Linder's name Mm -hmm. for example each of them is a punch of evidence I've never in the past set something I've written as required reading for anything because I've known people who do that and who will do it in every single module that they teach so I'll go, hey, you, need, you obviously need to read this thing that I've written. As an example of a piece of work which is hungry for evidence and which goes looking for it in places where you might not expect to find it, I think this might actually be useful for that sort of teaching mm. in the future. I'm willing to blow my trumpet that much, <laughs> but it might be inspiring as an example of how much evidence mm. it is important to get to make a historical case. And it's good to be tenacious about finding that evidence yeah. and just totally shun making vague assumptions about things. Things, making educated guesses that you can't substantiate in any way. In some cases, my evidence is in French. Actually, in a couple of places, my evidence is in German. And my translations of it are the translations of a non-native speaker. In some places, I got the help of some colleagues of mine who speak a lot better French than me. In some places, a Max Linder enthusiast who's a native speaker of German. So I got help on these. But in some cases, my translations are going to look... They're not going to look cavalier. They're just going to look remarkably uncreative. Because one of the things about translating is that if you translate a piece of fiction, for example, and if you translate a sentence literally, it can sound really clunky. And so there's often a lot of license in translation to completely rephrase things in order to get the sense get over. The yeah. mm-hmm. But my translations are clunky, mm-hmm. completely literal translations. But I figured the evidence is there, it's in French, it would be silly of me not to use it because it's not in my native language. It would be silly of me to tell this story about where the star system comes from and not take account of the fact that it started in France and in fact when I first started to make this discovery I sort of put together the first few scraps of evidence I did think right so I now need to spend a lot more time researching this French story and I need to spend a huge amount of time taking a bunch of stuff I've already written and just taking it completely Mm -hmm. to pieces I have to rebuild this half written book from the ground upwards and I had a moment where I thought shall I do this Mm. it's going to take a lot of time and effort but then I thought yeah of course I'm doing this it's going to mean going to France and it's going to mean me doing my absolute worst at trying to communicate with the people who run the 
various archives that I needed to use in France and lots of sorry can we do this bit in English please because most of the people I spoke with speak really good English and lots of me apologising for speaking really awful French but nonetheless it was rewarding another big lesson of this is that if you want to do a history of an industry even a very brief period in the history of an industry they tend to be international industries and so looking at these interactions between companies in different nations is almost inevitably going to be a part of what you have to do. Give it a crack and you will get interesting results, even if it means lots of depending upon the kindness of people who speak languages better than you do. I can't speak highly enough of the Cinémathèque Française people. They were most embarrassingly generous with the time they were giving me when I went to go and study some French trade papers, uh, a lot of their stills as well. And then the people at the Fondation Jérôme Soudou Pathé, who have the Pathé archive, they were really great as well. They genuinely seemed to want to help me do mm. research. In writing the book, I'm in a position of taking an account which already exists of why the star system emerged in the US, at least, by a guy called Richard de Cordova, who published this in 1990, and he died in 1996. I think he was only 40. I'm more than confident that had he lived any further, he would have produced second, third editions of this book, which increased his evidence base, added to the story, maybe even amended some parts. I'm coming to this in a sense of going, a lot of people regard Richard de Cordova's work as being the last word on this, but actually, would Richard de Cordova himself now Mm. say this? Wouldn't he be quite encouraged about somebody coming along and saying, let's at least widen our scope a little bit to see if what happened in the US might have actually been part of a larger story where the causality began elsewhere? And I even found a small note in Richard de Cordova's book where he says that while the star system contains both elements of discourse and elements of economic practice, he's going to focus in his book almost exclusively on discourse and not on economic practice and so what I tend to do in my book is to focus on economic practice so that what I do is provide something which should hopefully act as a complement to his book although I must also admit to having revisited every single one of the sources that he used and having found a couple of errors in his book as well errors which were completely understandable given that he was working in the pre-digitisation of everything era well that's the thing as well your research has been facilitated by advancing technologies and easier access to all of the data yeah I mean the Media History Digital Library is amazing it doesn't have digitised copies of all of the trade and popular publications that I need to use from this period but the fact that it's got digitised copies of Moving Picture World and Nickelodeon and Variety and from France it's got some digitised copies of Cine Journal those have been so useful Mm -hmm. although I've had to pop around the world quite a lot to do this I've been able to access things that would pre-digital era have necessitated a lot more popping back and forth across the Atlantic because you know when you if you do research and you go oh right I've found a new lead and in order to go and chase up that lead I now need to go back to that archive that I spent a week in when I was in another country and had no time. I now need to go back there just to check on one article on a page that I didn't look at when I was there. And of course, if that wasn't digitised, the answer to that would just be, I just can't do that. There's just no money, there's just no time. It would be ridiculous to cross the Atlantic, for example, to go and read one article that's in a trade paper that's held only in one archive. There's been lots of that, lots of coming, oh, I've got to go back to Moving Picture World now and look up something that happened in that month. So the fact that a lot of them are digitised has been absolutely essential and it's meant that I've been able to put together an evidence base for this which is something like four times the size of the one that Richard de Cordova had and it tends to be the case that when you put together a bigger picture what you thought was the whole story when you had the smaller picture actually turns out to be just an episode in the larger story Mm. which can actually be quite different from the the original version of the story. What did start out as an attempt to try to add to de Cordova's picture has become a testing of it, and although it stands up in some regards, I've had to amend other parts as well. It's not an enviable position because who wants to be pointing out amendments to uh, an account when the person who originally provided that account can't come back at you and go, I think you might be mistaken. Although any time I've put stuff in print which has challenged somebody else's work, what's happened is they've got in touch and we've had very productive conversations. I've never actually had a vendetta <laughs> with mm. anyone. I would imagine that if Richard Duckerdover was still alive, he would actually he, go, that's great. Or he could yeah. very well have found it himself. I think you've agonised over this a lot over the past few years and we've talked about it quite a bit. Probably the sensitivity of him having died so young as well. Perhaps is that why he's been even more revered than he might have been? The Jimmy Dean principle. 
Possibly. Um, I'm a contemporary person and I'm a contemporary person partly because of those financial constraints that you're mentioning. I've never had the mobility to bounce around the world to get data. When I did a PhD it was very home based. Everything was on my doorstep based in Belfast and the furthest I went was probably London during my PhD. I did quite a bit of research there and even that was beyond my means even with funding. So popping to America for anything is <laughs> is something I've never done and may never do. If I recall correctly, almost every research tip I've done for this has been a minimum two birds, one stone thing. I think it was about ten years ago now. I had a Harry Ransom Centre research fellowship so they, they pay you a bit of money to go and work at the University of Texas in the Harry Ransom Centre for a little bit and I was able to do a little bit of research on it then while I was also doing some HG Wells research the trip to Paris I looked at three different archives when I was in Paris I had a bit of a research allowance from my job to pay for that as well but of course it meant staying in the absolute cheapest place mm-hmm. I could find because who's got a research allowance big enough to take you to Paris for a fortnight I managed to cram the research into three days I think now the other thing about Richard Dokodova relevant to the book is that I found an obituary published in a a local newspaper which stated that he died of cancer so what I decided to do was to ask the publishers if they could give me a slightly higher royalty rate which they agreed to on the condition this is the condition I proposed that none of the royalties actually go to me on the condition that the royalties all go to Cancer Research UK and also asked them if they could put that on the back cover of the book as well because I'd like people to know this so I'm not going to get any royalties whatsoever from this book it's not to say that if I was to get the royalties, I would be getting huge amounts of money. No. <laughs> because academic book, tiny percentages are given. Mm. Cancer Research UK is going to be getting a small amount of money in my name. Eventually. For, for, <laughs> for a bit. You might yeah. get about 2.50 yeah. in about 10 years. One of my readers' reports said that the book will make a splash and mm. become a landmark work of star studies. That would be mm. lovely. That would be nice. Well, I actually have a plan from now on to do this with all of my publications because income from publications doesn't really matter. I got three books with Palgrave, for example, because Palgrave published the BFI Film Presses stuff. I've got a BFI Film Classic with Palgrave. I've got an entity collection called Menstruation and Cultural History and I've got an entity collection called Neurology and Modernity. So Palgrave sent me a thing every year and it's £25, perhaps, for these three three. books. Mm -hmm. While that's nice, it's not like I rely on it, and therefore the prospect of getting more income from more books isn't the kind of thing that I hanker after. Cancer Research UK will appreciate my income. Well, no, they won't, because it'll be next to their money. But, you know, the benefit from it more than I will. I also figure that if you ever manage to write something that gets traction with a popular audience, and that thing involves criticisms of anything, one of the things that anyone who tries to engage you in a spat will do is I'll say that you wrote the book in order to make money out of criticising the thing. And if I can say, no, I didn't, because I don't get any money from this book, the money goes to charity, then that will mean that Mm. I can't possibly be accused of that. I find it a shame that it's an anxiety, that you're worried about that kind of reaction, that, I mean, naturally anybody would be, when it should be a celebration, because you're putting so much new knowledge out there. For any of us writing a book, that's essentially what we're doing. And, of course, there are people who use their platform to be mean about other people but I think your concern about that isn't really doing justice to what you've actually done you've bounced off of what Dick Cordova produced and expanded on that you've corrected what's needed to be corrected you haven't done this maliciously and having read excerpts of it when you were writing it it certainly didn't come across that way we've talked extensively about the tone when you've had to deal directly with his work I would have agreed up until about two weeks ago when I read one of the readers' reports Mm -hmm. on it. And the reader said that my combative tone, especially with de Cordova, Mm -hmm. needed a bit of work. And I did think, how? With all those caveats and all of that gently framing what I was doing and all of the saying, I don't disagree with 90% of what de Cordova shows, Mm -hmm. I still managed to come across as combative. It's partly because your writing is very matter-of-fact and almost clinical. There's nothing wrong with that but I think people would maybe receive that coldly that maybe that's a projection on your work rather than what's coming from you we don't know who this is maybe this is someone who holds him in a very high regard Mm. so is maybe a bit defensive there could be a range of things Mm. going on there it could be an emotional response it could be this person has decided that 
that's what mm. Tom and you were writing in. We should look at those passages again and see if we can soften them well, even more. The editor at the press has specifically said, there's this one phrase, I think you should rephrase it. I will. Yeah, we're talking here about a couple of days' worth of small edits yeah. need to be done. But the, finished. part of the issue as well is this is going to be a beast of a book. It's long. Yeah, it's about 145,000 words long. I was images. present when you were hammering this thing out on your laptop. I saw the intensity of what went into putting those words together. When you're dealing with that large a document, there's going to be times when you're stressed and things maybe aren't coming out as calmly as you would like them to. It's a difficult thing to manage. Writing a book is a really very difficult process. There's times when I go back to mine to check something, check a reference or freshen up on something or whatever it is and I read a passage and I think, did I write that? That's not me. I would never write like that today. So you're constantly learning as a writer. It never really gets easier <laughs> I don't well, think. This is something I say to students that even if you go to one of the most senior your people in the school and uh-huh. say, is writing painful? Yes. They'll say yes. It's yes. horrific. Writing is painful. Douglas Adams is my touchstone on this. That was his life and it was the most painful thing in his life was to write and it was mm. his bread and butter. It was it was all he did. So much of the process is sheer pain. Stealing yourself to sit down and do it and it's a very difficult thing to do. And then the editing of something. I think especially if you're caring about what you do and you want it to be the best it can be if you're a perfectionist it's agonizing editing is agonizing I'm always advising students to just be less precious about the first draft. Mm -hmm. If it's not working, don't try and unwrite it and then rewrite it. Just set it aside and start a new file and Mm -hmm. start writing again from scratch. Whenever I say that, I always think, am I giving them the best advice? Because my knee-jerk reaction when I hear myself saying that Mm. is, how could you possibly ever do that to your own writing? And it's because I'm being precious about my own writing. I'm thinking, yeah, the thing I've been writing recently, could I ever just do that? Could I ever just set it aside and Mm. start a new file? You'd cry. It would be so so painful. When students come to you in bits because their laptop has broken and they didn't back up their files and they've lost everything and you're saying you've still got all your notes this is all fresh because you've just written it so do it again in the three days before the deadline you'll be grand sure. (laughs) All the while you're going I'm actually feeling physically ill because I could not deal with that if that happened to me for a publication I was working on. I've got this book backed up on two separate yeah. things. I discovered Dropbox when I was doing my PhD it saved my life. I think there were early drafts of things in my first year that I lost because of a faulty uh, or a flash drive I had became corrupted. When it's your whole life is on a little disc It's awful, it's really heartbreaking. The idea of writing again from scratch terrifies me because I'm a better editor than I am a writer. I'd rather have a lump of crap to mould into something beautiful than Mm. nothing. I'm a big fan of, and students always look at me so askance when I say this, you may use the word askance in any situation (laughs) other than how someone looks at you when you've said something dodgy. Students always look at me askance when I say, if you're having problems getting the ideas out, just go for a walk, Mm -hmm. go and talk to yourself for a bit. Because getting blood pumping by going for a walk Mm -hmm. or trying to articulate it verbally rather than in writing, these are all easier ways of doing things than writing. And what I envision in that kind of situation is somebody who's done all of the research they need to do, who's utterly confident about the case they Mm -hmm. need to make and is even utterly confident about the overall structure in which they're going to need to make that case. So it's going to be like a five-step structure. When I'm in that place... When I've done all the research, know exactly what argument I'm going to make and in what stages. I adore just writing from scratch. Mm. And it's painful, yeah. but it's still a really enjoyable situation. Yeah. There's been times when I've started writing before I'm ready. I think that's the worst thing, is you can then get stuck with editing draft material that you produced when you weren't ready. I think that's a very good point. In academia, it's so pressured now. Mm. And with REF in the UK, the research excellence 
to mark there's more pressure than ever to be producing 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 and it has to be of the top quality everybody's overworked and exhausted early career people are in constant <coughs> anxiety because of this and that was certainly my experience I'm a year out of a lecturing post now I still have this overbearing feeling and I know I've got loads of ideas gestating mm. I've got ideas for at least four books that I want to write and I know mm. exactly what I want to do with them but it's going to take time to do the research and time to do the writing and I feel the anxiety of those hanging over me because I just feel like I should have had them done five minutes ago yeah. I can't shake that feeling I don't know if I ever will I feel like even when we're doing these recordings and they're useful and they're productive yeah. and we're producing output to yeah. put it in institutional terms and hopefully they'll be of use or of interest to other people and other scholars or people who have just general interest in these topics but I feel like this isn't what I'm supposed to be I'm supposed to be writing a book right now and why am I not chained to the laptop constantly there's two things going on there one of which is years of institutions telling you produce or you're worthless but the other one is you do love writing mm. even though it's painful you love not just the use of language but the product of a research process product of sitting down, asking questions, formulating models, testing those models against evidence, compiling masses of evidence, fitting that into a bigger picture, seeing if the bigger picture needs to change, doing all that stuff and then expressing your findings in writing is great. So in addition to being institutional pressures from the outside, it's also something which we do get completely understandably addicted to mm-hmm. doing. Yes. It's like, why is it that you're feeling itchy that you're not smoking? If you're someone who's tried to quit smoking, yes, right? Yeah. Because you're actually addicted to the nicotine. We could say, oh, it's nothing like addiction to an actual harmful substance because writing is harmless, but it does tend to it takes occupy it out of you. you. Oh, yeah, and yeah. exhaust you, yeah. It's harmless in one sense, and that it's very therapeutic. But it's also, if you're writing to meet deadlines and if you're having to hit those high standards for whatever reason, if you have targets you need to reach, it's very stressful and there's a lot at stake. And if you know that something is going to peer review and the peer review process can be horrific as well. Show me a scholar who hasn't had their work completely torn to shreds and somebody be incredibly rude about it. Because there are people out there who are plain nasty and don't really give constructive criticism they'll just tell you you're stupid in about six pages of notes as somebody who works on film in a school of english english literature language and linguistics i'm working in amongst a bunch of scholars who are working on something slightly different from what i work on and external examiners who are asked to look at the work that students do for my modules are being asked to look at work on a topic that they haven't worked on so i'm really used to being in a field where people are making judgments about yeah. the stuff that comes my way even though they're not experts in it i suppose the difference between external examiners and peer reviewers is that peer reviewers should be able to go i'm not an expert on this I'm not the person you want to read this. But some people don't seem to think that peer review ought to work in that rigorous way in our discipline. Some people just go, yeah, fine, send it my way. There's times when I think, wouldn't it be nice if just once the peer review process for something I produced was really lax and slapdash and it just got waved through. And I think that, and then I go, no, it wouldn't, because that would be our discipline living up to its popular misconception. Every bit of peer review I've had, the stuff that was unsolicited at least, if it's stuff, you know, it's part of a special issue or it's part of an editor collection where I was a approach to write the thing the peer review tends to be less exacting but everything I've done which is unsolicited I have had really merciless readers reports I mean merciless in the sense of even when they were being really complimentary they're being measured they're being rigorous no one's just waving anything through and I feel the critical ones I've had have been difficult to read I'm always encouraging students, read the critical feedback, Mm -hmm. but I can understand why. It's very difficult. They often don't. Especially when I've read through something for somebody I know and care about. It's even more difficult than doing it for a stranger. Just try and constantly make sure you're not coming across as mean when you want them to do their best work. You know, you want them to do better. By the same token, when we do peer review, we are harsh in part because we realise why it was people were harsh to us. We're gatekeepers. If we just let stuff through that's awful, that's going to devalue the quality of yeah, the discipline. Yeah. When you do peer review and you are very rigorous, sometimes you're being rigorous with something 
something which is amazing. And the rigorous is just identifying how great it is mm -hmm. and why it is you're saying, yes, unreservedly publish this. I think there was a time once when I was, it was before I became one of the editors at Early Popular Visual Culture, I was just one of its readers. There was a time once when my reader's report, it was something like 800 words long, and then I had to just give a decision. And the decision was accept, minor revisions, major revisions, etc. And instead of any of these, the decision I put was publish this little beauty with dispatch. Because it was wonderful. It was just this amazing piece of scholarship about cars in visual culture during the horse period. So during the period when the norm is that people are still travelling on horse-drawn buses and carriages when cars still arrive it's the visual culture of cars during this period when cars are actually slower than mm -hmm. horse-drawn carriages great article wonderful in every respect the only recommendations I had were for little bits of extra evidence that I knew of that the person didn't seem to know of but the person had abundant evidence anyway mm -hmm. so it was one of those oh, is there anything I can suggest here Peer review is a joy when you have something like that. It's important that peer review go, this is great. But there's a record of that as well, in addition to the record No, that is nice. That stuff. It's been incredible when I've received reviews that are like that. It's an amazing feeling to progress from six pages of scathing notes yeah. that make you feel like the lowest form of being on the planet. How dare and you have written anything. To then have progressed to a point where you're saying, like, happy to publish this as it is, but if you want to fix up a couple of things, here's a couple of wee bits that could be yeah. clarified, but really it's fine. You've done as much as you can physically do with 6,000 words. That was a really special moment for me. I felt like, yeah, I've made it now. That was when I was in the nicest job I've ever had as well. Mm. It was a really good, productive year too, which mm. feels very distant now. But it's fundamental to be in a place where you are stable enough to write. Because if you're just living seat of your pants, going from you know, three-month contract to three-month contract, the chances of you being able to research and write are next to zero. I mean, at that point, that was I was about halfway through a 10-month contract, which is short enough. And it wasn't perfect, but it was the best mm. I'd ever done. It was the nicest job of all the jobs I've had, and I've had many. I was really well supported, and I had money to go, you know, they funded me to go away to conferences. They supported me doing research-led teaching. So I had a really happy time when I was at Lancaster. We had that sort of Damocles hanging over you, because mm. it was ending in a few months. But I really went for it because it built my confidence up to the point where I thought, I am acing this, I am really good at this career, I could really make a go of this if I could just get a permanent job somewhere, or at least something that lasts longer than just shy of a year. It was a tough time after that. The writing process, it's difficult anyway, and then when you've got the obstacles of the things life is throwing at you, it's very frustrating to hear people saying, oh, you just have to make time, or you just have to do it anyway and I think when your mental health is broken and you physically can't and words are that painful and that was the thing about the writing process I find it healing and therapeutic but I've had a problem with, since I had the health problems of last year my brain works very differently than it used to I lose words and language is so important to me and I'm fascinated by it there are times when I have lost words it's a kind of aphasia and it's incredibly frustrating when you're trying to write and the word's not coming it's gone there's an image in my head but I can't write that down I can't describe the image the words that belong to that image or the feeling I have do not exist for me in that moment and they might exist in two days time but I don't in the time that I need them I think that's improved it's not as bad as it was it's tricky it's another thing to overcome as painful as the writing process is anyway Anyway, when there are things against you and also of course there's the practical things if I have a laptop that shuts itself down at will or freezes mm. constantly so it slows me down a bit it's as if we're of one <laughs> we're sharing each other's senility being in a situation of going I know exactly the sensation mm. that how would you phrase it I'm just giving you an example of it now. I know that there is a word for this sensation that I'm having now, or for this idea that I'm having now. I know that there's a word for it. I think what's happened is that you used to be superhuman, and something took your powers away, and you <laughs> became like us. Like that time when, I think it was in the second Superman film? I'm talking the ones from the 1980s. Oh, right? the proper when, ones? Yeah, when Superman <laughs> went into that chamber and had his powers taken away. Oh, okay. He got beaten up by a normal person. <laughs> That's what's happened to you. 
It's my kryptonite. I probably already had this kind of issue, but it was wildly exacerbated by the mental health issues that arose during an extremely difficult time that led me to leave academia. There's no provision for mental health issues, really, in this country. And I think, actually, that brings us full circle with Max Linder. Linda. I think calling um, him Max Linder is completely fine. Yeah, because. Max Linder. We'll never know, probably, what happened to him and his wife. Yeah. Maybe it's wrong to speculate, but the fact that he seems to have murdered his young wife and then killed himself, I mean, we don't know if that's what's happened or if it was a suicide mm. pact. Or... Well, this is the interesting thing, because according to Maud Linda, she was told by the family members and the nanny who was raising her, when she was ultimately told about it, she was told that Max had killed his wife and then killed himself. Mm-hmm. And that is difficult for anyone who wants to kill themselves... Even the job of killing themselves is, of course, a huge mountain, but Mm -hmm. add to that the job of killing somebody else as well. There are certain aspects of us that make it very difficult to do that. But that's what she was told by those near to her. Whereas, of course, the press at the time just referred to a double suicide. Yes, and it's the way it was put, and even in the documentary that Maud Linder is providing the narration for. How was it worded? He killed himself and took his young wife with him. It's very euphemistic, whereas a hundred years later, you're thinking, well, was this domestic abuse? Mm -hmm. And this woman was less than half his age? Yeah, they point out that he was 40 and she was 17. Mm. There's a whole spectrum of things it could be, isn't there? It could could be, be she could have had absolutely crippling postpartum psychosis and have convinced him that he had as little reason to live as she did. We just don't know, and we don't know anything about his personal life. We don't know if... Hundreds of years on, would they have had diagnoses of things that could have yeah. saved their lives? Maybe he was bipolar. This is the thing which recently has been proposed about George III, that maybe it wasn't the thing that was his quote-unquote madness. It wasn't one of the many conditions mm-hmm. that's been proposed before, that, that simply that he was extremely mm-hmm. bipolar. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the places where film history becomes biography. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people will go straight into that field of history with enthusiasm. It involves needing to understand people quite a lot, and that's where my skills, I think, end <laughs> understanding the human. It involves too much speculation, I think, it's to, speculative, to have any confidence. That's the problem. Any to give confidence about what happened. That's the problem. And if there's no records of people who knew him well, and there's basically next to nothing about his wife, it seems I'm mm. just talking as if I know what I'm talking about. It's just that's really all she's referred to as, and she was very young, very young to have a child you don't know what's going on there but I think just in light of abuse that is coming to light and is starting to be evidenced in the film industry as well and of course is there a toxic masculinity that's already affecting him I mean in one of the clips the documentary we watched was essentially a clip show rather than a documentary it was the narrative built around clips from his films to facilitate the showing of the clips of the films rather than really anything else but one of them was he's holding a baby and I think his wife's in another room with another man. She was and a doctor. Oh, right. So she's so. examined like, because I was in and out, I think, at that point, was I? <laughs> you were on your phone. I was on my phone checking <laughs> something. The film was he'd gone to see a doctor. Right. And the doctor was her. And she'd examined him and he was really ticklish and really nervous. And then he'd come back the next day and much more confidently proposed to her. And she said yes. And then flick forwards, they've got a baby. And he brings the baby into work one day to go and see see her and there's about six men in her waiting room and yes. she's got one man in with her uh-huh. and she's examining him in that she's holding her arms around him from the back mm-hmm. and listening to his lungs from the back and looked like a way of medically examining somebody and then he gets really jealous and rather interestingly gives the baby <laughs> to one of the guys who yes. he's about to throw out throws out all but that guy uh-huh. throws the guy out even though he's got the baby with him grabs him at the last minute takes the baby back and then throws him out properly his narratives of male jealousy are really big well you see what I find interesting was that while he was walking with the baby through all these men in the waiting room they were all looking up staring at him and 
then looking at him disparagingly, I said, oh, he's holding a baby. That's not man's work. You know, you could see this actually being conveyed in their faces. And he was aware of it and sort of turning around and they would hide behind their newspapers. And I was starting to think this is the stirrings of toxic masculinity because this is a man caring for his baby and other men are disparaging him for caring for his baby because Mm. they associate that with women's work. So if his wife's in the next room in what is typically man's work as a doctor at this point and she's the doctor for all these men and he's getting wildly jealous you've got the comedy of him throwing them all out and the baby getting mixed up in it and then he's back in with the wife and there's a big kiss because oh how romantic is this that oh I'm not threatened by all these other men that you need to examine for professional reasons it just felt like this is toxic masculinity on display it was a mixture of what could be regarded as a criticism of toxic masculinity in that the antagonists or at least the enemies of our main character are the men who are judging the man for holding a baby yes but he's then mistaken for seeing them as antagonists They're just customers. Most of the films about him being the carer while his wife works. Yes, but... But then the ending doesn't go, oh, he's an idiot for having done that. It redeems him. It says, well done, you are a guardian of a husband. So part of the film seems to go, isn't toxic masculinity horrible? And then at the end it goes, isn't it great? I don't think it does. That's how early this is coming through in cinema. And I think more than 100 years later, we're still at a point where Mm. you're actually perpetuating this. It was like with the three billboards thing. Sam Rockwell wins an Oscar for his performance as a racist, abusive murderer. You've gone beyond the point where you can make comment about that sort of thing because you're making it okay because you keep redeeming that character. You keep redeeming the person who totally flips the lid and does unacceptable things. I mean, this is very early on, but it doesn't mean we can be okay with it. Mm. The same as we don't have to be okay with blackface in The Jazz Singer. It needs to be called out, but it's worrying that he's writing these films. It's comedy. It's making light of that kind of situation, that kind of jealousy. And it sanctions violence through that jealousy and it's totally unreasonable he's a guardian husband Mm. he can't trust his wife to just get on with her job and look after the baby he hands the Mm. baby to a stranger does art reflect life does life reflect art in this situation it's not always helpful to psychologize an artist through their work Mm. but there's such a collapse here as you've already pointed out with the character and the person playing the character and they have the same name in his case how Um, much of it is him acting out things that he thinks are okay it's possible that the current here might go the other way rather than it being that the fictional max is just a slightly caricature version of the real max it might be that the real max was a contrivance just as much as the fictional max so it may be that we don't have no idea what this guy was actually like One of the things I propose in the book, actually, is that the latter is a version of a public persona that the film industry directly solicits. One of the things about all these Max films is that Max is a bit of an idiot. And the comedy comes from our main character, Mm. our protagonist character, being a bit of an idiot. It's slightly different from dramas in that we are being invited, the implied viewer at least, is being invited to... Mm. uh, No, the actual viewer is being invited to laugh at the main character. But that may, of course, be a cover for identification with the main character. And that has never gone away. And I think the fact that it's played for laughs has never gone away. I mean, you've had whole TV series and many, 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 many films that have done that exact same thing. Because I got to a point of fatigue with Family Guy, for example. Having this portrayal of the fat, ignorant, white, American, privileged man who gets away with absolutely everything and it's played for laughs and isn't he so stupid? Da, 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 da. No, no, mm. no, no. We've got Trump in the White House now. This is no longer funny. You need to stop privileging mediocre men getting all the glory because only when that stops does everybody else everybody else get a say. I suppose this brings us on to one of the other aspects of this, which is that it showed a film that Max had made on a visit to Spain. Part of the film is his Max series character learning how to be a Toreador and doing it awfully. But then the second part of the film is actual Max Linder dressed in a Toreador's outfit actually fighting bulls. Mm. 
Although he was actually fighting rather small bulls, mm. I think he'd been deliberately given a small fry. And not just fighting them, but killing them. They'd done that thing of giving him those metal spears mm-hmm. with tassels on, and it showed, stage by stage, him putting about six of them into a small bull. And then there was a moment when he, using a sword, stabbed it in the back of the head, and it seemed to pretty much instantly die. And that's one of those moments where you go, oh, different era. And I know that bullfighting still happens now. But for the purposes of making a film, you wouldn't do it for real. When you've got the licence, because it's fiction, to not do something for real. Mm. I've seen some films from this period, and I've seen stills from some films from this period, where they represent animals by just getting humans dressed up in costumes. And it's a comedy, so it that's works. okay. There's one still that I've seen from a um, another one of Pathé's films from about 1911, where one of our main characters, one of the female series characters, who was known as... Blanking. She was known as Betty in the UK and the US, but she had a different name in France. She's being a lion tamer in mm. this film, and the lion, in inverted commas, <laughs> is just a dog mm. with a mane bit of costume attached around its neck. It's not a lion, but it's a comical lion, okay? Why do they feel that they needed, in this Max film from 1912-ish, why did they feel that they needed mm-hmm. to go actual bullfighting? Well, I suppose films at that point still had travel documentary appeal, mm-hmm. in that it was possible to show people footage of bits from other mm-hmm. parts of the world, and that could be part of the appeal of the film. Mm-hmm. So this is still a period when fiction ha- still has elements of documentary mm-hmm. appeal in it. The way the crowd gathers around almost carries them off, mm-hmm. and yeah. it's very celebratory. It did feel like it switched into documentary. It felt like that's real. That's a real scene that they're actually... This is real people with the movie star Max Linder. She collapsed between that and the setup. You often hear about stars being mobbed. And I've seen some stills of stars being surrounded by massive crowds. But the accounts are usually overblown and they usually are not more plentiful than the actual photos of people being mobbed. But that was live mm. footage of somebody being that was real. lifted yeah. on the shoulders of a crowd of several hundred people. Mm. And he really seemed to be like, OK, this has happened before, but I'm now on the shoulders of these several hundred people. I'm being carried somewhere, I don't, I don't know where I'm being carried, I'm being carried out of this stadium, it seems. Maybe they're just going to dump me in a river. But I have to go with this. And he was looking quite happy, and his, well, at least he was going with it, and putting on a happy face and waving his hat. Mm. These are people who were famous with publics who were ordered of magnitude larger mm. than the publics with whom theatre stars were famous just because of the reproducibility of the yeah. public. It's early film, so it's intertitles, so to them he's a Spanish hero as much as he's a French hero. Of course, yeah. And I wonder, is there a cultural difference there? Would they be more reserved in France? Or in the Spaniards, mm. it's party time. <laughs> 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 they go for mm. fiesta straight after. Mm. One thing that was quite revealing was one of the extras, which was the little interview with Maud Linda from 1963, mm. so even earlier. She referred to how she had a... Oh, what was it? She was referring to English reserve in her Australian nanny. It wasn't reserve, was it? It was English something, English upbringing or English childminding. Anyway, English to mean cold and military right. in the way that you treat people. And now, of course, we would probably say German if we wanted to refer to a cold military treatment of kids. Or Prussian, even. English we might associate with unemotional, but we wouldn't associate it with military regimented. Yeah, well when I tell the likes of you that you're being too English, I mean you're being too polite about something. You're uh, trying to spare everybody's feelings to the point where you're causing pain to yourself. (laughs) That's Englishness to me, in the kindest way I can put it. Other than that, you're the colonial oppressor. (laughs) Yes, yeah. There is no English equivalent for catch yourself on. To just, der- your neck to, <laughs> to just deride somebody humorously but dismissively. Yeah, we don't have that. We've just got. Would you mind awfully? Could, 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 could you not? <laughs> could, you, could you just not? Yeah, we need to work on that. We need to all have like a, an away day. The entire country needs to have an away day. We can consult the Welsh on this, I suppose. <laughs> don't necessarily have to cross the Irish Sea. Do you have any other points? I feel like there were loads of questions I probably had as you were talking, but I didn't want to disrupt your flow. That was quite a flow. But I think there were quite a few things that would be useful to tease out in the middle of that. Yeah. It's late and that's um, probably we've about a lot. quite a bit to go on. It's been a pleasure to chat with you about me. <laughs> But no, it's been good to let you loose on your own work. 
as is the case with anything that is about to get published, I've basically already moved on to a different research area. Well, thank you for telling us all about your book and Max Lander. Next time, Dr Blair, mm-hmm. I think you need to tell me all about something that you're either writing on mm-hmm. or have been writing on in the past. I will do. Tip for tat. We didn't really get round to the contemporary relevance of the emergence of stars, but maybe that's something we can have a look at another time in more depth. I mean, relevance to phenomena that we can observe happening now? Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. It's one of those things where, in our very broad line of work in the arts and humanities, we have to justify our existence all the time. So the very cheeky question is, why should we care about this guy? And why should we care about the emergence of film stardom today? I can take one minute. We should care about this because the story is about a phenomenon that happened to a cultural industry. The story proposes a model of how cultural industries acquire star systems and whether they acquire star systems at all. Such a model could be tested against a much newer cultural industry. Testing such models involves waiting for real-world things to happen. So it would mean, well, actually, I suppose the opportunity we've just missed is testing it against internet-specific celebrities. If we were to pretend we'd never heard of internet-based celebrities, we could look at what's just happened over the past 15 or so years and find that, if we did look at it, if we found that there was a familiar story, then we have a working model about how personhood and cultural industries interact. And that would enable us to make predictions about how they're going to function in the future. And, of course, just as an exercise in here's some evidence, here's a claim, let's test that claim against the evidence, any piece of scholarship is useful as an exercise in producing accurate knowledge. So this could be about anything. Mm -hmm. I'm into why do things happen. So it could be about any question about why something happened and that would be worthwhile doing if it somehow raised the general bar for Mm -hmm. rigour and precision in coming up with conclusions. Well, that probably could bounce us on to a topic of mine at some later point as well because it's an ambitious big project that I want to do is fact-checking the hell out of Damien Hurst's last exhibition <laughs> and everything around it. This is fact-checking of something which is deliberately and openly lying. Openly a myth. Many, many, many layers of mythology from yeah. all over the world from across thousands of years. But in addition to the deliberate open lies, there may be some actual closed lies in there as well, some covert Absolutely. actual untruths. Yes. And that are not presented as untruths. Kernels of truth, truth within the lies, and what all of that can teach us in this mm. world of fake news. How do you unravel the myths from reality? And what is reality? What is truth? All those really massive questions. As I find myself saying, any time anyone says something like, science deals with facts, not with truth, I always go, no, the truth is whatever can be demonstrated to be true. Science deals with that. So when you say, what is truth? My instinct is to go, truth is whatever can be demonstrated to be true. All we know is that it's out there still. (laughs) (laughs) And will always continue to be out there. Anyway. Thank you very much for that. That's right, I'm here all week. More than a year after recording that discussion, <laughs> we, yes. we're back again because we were holding this back to coincide with the publication of Andrew's book. We're recording this at the end of April 2019 and you have a publication date now, don't you? Yes, I have good news and bad news. I mean, the fact that we're recording this over a year after having recorded mm. that is an indication of how long it takes books to get published. I already had a contract to publish it when we had that discussion. I was just finishing it off and now it's gone through the whole publication process. It's going to be out very soon. Publication date is 30th of May 2019. And even on the publisher's website, it says the 16th of May. I don't know why. Anyway, some point in late May. It is completely and totally done. The entire manuscript has been, typescript, has been supplied to the publisher. The index is done, you know, all that kind of work. I've proofed the back cover, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's all completely done, so it's going to be an object very soon. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of physically, visibly vibrating Mm -hmm. at at the anticipation of this. (laughs) However, the bad news is that even when we recorded this, and we didn't know when we Mm -hmm. recorded this, Maud Linda had already died. Maud Linda, whose real name, of course, Maud Linda was a bit of an affectation because Max Linda wasn't even her dad's name. 
Maud Linder, who was Maud Lydie Marcel Lovoyel, she died in October 2017. Mm. That's a good innings for somebody who was born in 1924. So we were discussing the work of somebody who had recently died when we Mm. did this, sadly, and we didn't know. Never managed to get hold of her while she was alive. I sent her lots of letters, but she was, and I was told this by acquaintances of hers, she was rather difficult to communicate with in her last few years, probably because of the standard reason why somebody who's in their 90s would be quite difficult to communicate with in the last few years. But yes, very sadly, Maud Linda had already died when we recorded this. One thing I forgot to mention when we recorded this was who was going to be publishing this book, what publisher, and it's actually good that I didn't because the publisher has changed now. It was <laughs> I.B. Taurus, and I.B. Taurus has since then been acquired by Bloomsbury Academic. So it will be a Bloomsbury book. And I've seen the cover and it's very beautiful. Mm. It's the first time turquoise has ever been a part of my repertoire of <laughs> cover colours. I'm, you know, open mind, it's a nice cover. Don't buy it because you will never pay off the debt if you buy it because it's, <laughs> mm. its recommended retail price is £85. Yeah. Standard academic book stuff. There will be an ebook. Pick it up on, on Amazon Marketplace <laughs> in a year's time when someone's selling it secondhand. But, you know, university libraries will get it. And I will have a book launch shortly at Newcastle University. Great. And is there anything else you'd like to say? Oh, yeah. One thing. Mm-hmm. I haven't mentioned what the title of the book is. Yes. Yeah. And it's changed over the years. It's called The Origins of the Film Style System, Persona, Publicity and Economics in Early Cinema. Lovely. Not my choice of title, but a compromise between my choice of title and the publisher's yeah. cho- choice of title. You lucky things having an insight into the type of world that we live in. Yeah, well, I thought it was important to do some coverage of the writing and publication process in academic publishing because that's what people have to go through to get any of their work done. Yeah, and it takes a long, long, long time. Yeah. And that is made an even longer time if you work in visual culture Mm. because of the logistics of getting images from archives Mm -hmm. and all of the fiddling around with how they're going to be placed in the book for example, and all the negotiating how many you can have. If no one does happen to be able to afford it, you'll get to see something that has got a good few very interesting images in it, as good film history should. And you have since moved school within Newcastle as well? Oh yeah, I said uh, we talked about me being in the School of English Literature, Language and Linguistics. I'm now in the School of Arts and Cultures, which has meant moving about 50 feet yes. in the university. I'm in the next building. Does, Different just people. Just in case anyone is looking for you on the website and you're not on the right school anymore just thought it's worth mentioning that you've moved thank you Ian for telling us so much being so articulate and remembering so much about all of your process I think it's useful for people out there if they're doing archive research this is a really useful one hopefully to listen to hopefully we'll have a good shindig for the launch and of course I've now remembered we have a deal to have a nice long chat about Damien Hirst. Yeah, I've already done an ep- I've already released an episode. Oh, I escaped. I with, escaped chatting you escaped about that. that. How dare you. We can do it sometime anyway, but um, I don't want to platform him too much because he doesn't really need it. <laughs> it was more my clever ideas about his work. I thought were nice to platform. <laughs> you do realize you, have, you now have to drop that microphone. <laughs> you can't not. So yeah, anyway, but yes, you're on skates because I read my essay already for the podcast when I needed an episode. As as an avid (laughs) listener to it, I should already know that. (laughs) I'm a bit behind. Right, well, thank you. You've been listening to Audiovisual Cultures with me, Paula Blair and Andrew Scheel. This episode was recorded and edited by Paula Blair and the music is Common Ground by Airtone, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 and available for download from ccmixter.org. If you like the show and find its contents useful and interesting, please help cover production and distribution costs by donating to paypal.me forward slash PEA Blair and liberapay.com forward slash PEA PEA Blair. Episodes are released every other Wednesday. Please rate, share and subscribe on your chosen listening platform as this helps others find the show. For more information visit audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com and follow AV Cultures on Twitter and Facebook. Thanks for listening and catch you next time.